To coincide with the release of the latest video with kings and generals, on Timur's victory at Ankara in 1402, today we'll look at the armors of the early Timurids, their evolution from the armors of the Mongol Empire, and how they affected the military of Amir Timur. As we've not talked much about Timur on this channel, it would be useful to provide him a brief introduction, which I will allow my friend Tariq of Hikmah History to do for us. Timur was a legendary 14th century Turco-Mongolian conqueror whose military exploits put him amongst the great conquerors like Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. Born in around 1336 near Samarkand in the Chagatai Khanat, Timur spent the 1360s and 70s gaining and consolidating control of Transoxiana. The 1380s would see him go on the offensive. Focusing on the Persian world, he conquered Khorasan and Persia. But it was in the 1390s that Timur would establish a legendary reputation as a feared conqueror. He invaded the Golden Horde and defeated its leader, Tohtamesh, before casting his eyes on the riches of India. There, in 1398, he defeated the Delhi Sultanate and looted its capital at Delhi. Next, he set out for the Middle East and defeated the Mamluk Sultanate in Syria, in the process bringing the realm of another former Mongol Empire subdivision, the Ilkhanat, under his control. But his magnum opus was the Battle of Ankara in 1402, where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sultan Bayezid of the Ottoman Empire and emerged victorious. Having essentially brought three out of the four subdivisions of the Mongol Empire under his influence, Timur set out to conquer the former Yuan dynasty's realm in China, but died on the way there in 1405. If you want to find out more about this epic conqueror, check out the video I did on him. Thanks Tariq. Be sure to check out his channel, Hikma History, for more on the history of the Islamic world. Aside from his assistance, my friends Matt Capua, Frank Perrin, and Marco Boldrini assisted with research on this episode. Tamer's armies, like those of Chinggis Khan, relied on a corps of nomadic horse archers, supplemented by subject and vassal peoples. Tamer's fighting corps were men from the Chagatai Khanate, Turco-Mongolian tribes called Chagatais in the sources. The Poro Chagatais were similarly equipped to the Mongols of the 13th century. The average Chagatai wore little or no armor, just a delg or kaftan or perhaps cloth armor, and avoided direct contact with the foe. Skilled archers, they relied on their composite war bows and several remounts to do as much damage to the enemy at range for as long as possible. Knives, axes, and clubs were used for closer combat. The Turco-Mongolian saber also saw a continued use, generally with greater curvature. Shamshirs are known to have been employed. One example is attributed to Tamer himself. For personal protection, these warriors had small shields of varying designs, such as the Iron Sipur, a Persian buckler, or the Halka, a light Mongolian-style shield made of cane or wicker, and reinforced with an iron boss. Closer and more regular contact with cities in Transoxiana and Iran brought greater access to arms and armor beyond typical nomadic fare, especially of Persian influence. A greater proportion of Timur's troops had access to heavier armors compared to those of Chinggis Khan. Perhaps reflective of this, Timur-era artwork routinely shows armored men, though this may just be convention and we must caution against suggesting every Timurid was heavily armored because of it. Due to Mongol domination of much of the Islamic world since the 1250s, and strong Turkic control for centuries prior, by the time of Timur, there was considerable mutual influence on the armors of local peoples and the new rulers. From Central Asia through Iran and the Caucasus, be they Timurid, Iranian, or Turkmen, armors were remarkably similar, with relatively minor regional differences and depending on what the wearer could afford or access. We'll focus on the Timurids, but much of what we describe here is applicable to any number of states rising from the ashes of the Ilkhanite. Mobility 
and not interfering with drawing a bow was a primary demand for these armor designs. The cheapest armors available for the average Timurid trooper was the Hatangutel. The Hatangutel was composed of layers of felt forming essentially a long length gambazon, which could be worn underneath heavier armors. We see a gradual shortening of the Hatangu over this period due perhaps to improvements in leg and shin armors. The Hatangu could have iron plates sewn into it, making a brigandine. These are among the most common armors of the period. Even lowly Timurids seem to have worn helmets more often than Mongols, often with the distinct feature of nasal protection which extended down the face. While laminar armor, that is, bands of leather layered upon each other, is depicted with some regularity in the Ilkhanite. It's commonly depicted in Timurid manuscripts as a horse armor. Timurid artwork depicts horse armor more regularly than early Ilkhanite artworks. In colorful, long laminar bands and an iron chanfron protecting the horse's head. Lamellar armor was the heaviest armor of the Mongols, made of small metal plates, mostly iron, laced together in horizontal rows. By the Timur era, we see it in the form of lamino lamellar. Here, we still have rows of lamellar, but each row was fixed to a leather band. When these bands were laced together vertically, the leather band protected the lacing, often left exposed in earlier lamellar armors. While forming a sturdy armor, the lacing allowed it to remain very flexible. The example worn by my friend Marco Boldrini has 407 hardened steel lamellar plates, weighing a total of 12 kilos. Aside from this heavier use of laminar bands among the lamellar, in the 14th century we also see a shortening of the folds, or skirts, of the armor. Mongol lamellar and laminar was long reaching right to the ankles in some depictions. When riding, it folded down to protect the legs, with added protection coming from armored boots. Timurid and post Ilkhana designs instead reached to the knees or higher, with the lower legs protected by iron greaves. Likewise, the lower arms and hands were exposed even in the heaviest Mongol armors. The hands needed to be left unencumbered to not impede use of the bow, the primary weapon. Among the Timurids and other post-Mongol states in Iran, we see the emergence of bazubans, iron van braces protecting the forearms and often the back of the hand and thumb. Among the Jalayarids in northwestern Iran, another Ilkhanid successor state and longtime foes of Timur, we see full gauntlets depicted around the 1380s. True gauntlets, however, do not seem to have spread amongst the Timurids. Due to Iranian influence in metal workers, we see a great increase in use of chain mail among the Timurids. Mail was rare among the Mongols, who as nomads in the open steppe found it burdensome to produce and maintain. For Timur, in much more regular contact with cities outside of destroying them, mail was a valuable protection, covering areas otherwise left exposed. Male aventails, for example, are a regular feature in Timurid manuscripts. Over the 15th century, the usage of male skirts encouraged the shortening of torso armor, and full mail and plate replaced most lamellar variants over the later 15th century. To some extent, it appears Timur provided at least some of his soldiers with armor. The men were expected to provide their own weapons. Like the Mongols, the Chagatai nomad and his family constructed his bow and arrows. Most lower-ranking soldiers were probably on their own as for protecting the rest of their body. However, Tamer also continued the favored Mongol practice of relocating craftsmen to his capital of Zamarkand in great numbers. A Spanish ambassador to Tamer noted that, upon Tamer's return to Samarkand in 1404, his captured smiths presented him with 3,000 sets of finished armor, seemingly brigandine, which Tamer then distributed to his followers. In this specific case, it was lords and the upper class warriors getting the suits. 
We might imagine then that Temur took the effort to ensure at least part of his heavy cavalry, and the members of his Keshig were well armored. A perk of being part of his retinue. The proximity to manufacturing centers in Central Asia meant warriors could more conveniently commission armors, and certainly, after a battle, many helped themselves to the spoils of war. And when you fought for Temuri Lung, you had no shortage of victorious battlefields to pick over. This has been a brief overview of the armors of the early Timurids. Again, thanks to my friends Matt, Frank, Marco, and Tariq for their contributions to this video. If you can, be sure to check out Hikma History on YouTube, and check out the videos on Timur I wrote for Kings and Generals.